Okay, thanks a lot, Peter. Um, well, as you can see, and presumably you could tell from the program, I'm Jeff Waldock from Sheffield Hallam University. And as you can also see from this front page slide, what we're um, going to be talking about is um, a project that we've developed. And this originated, uh, by, I guess, two or three years back, Stephen Hibbert, the University of Nottingham, pulled together a group of people interested in developing employability within the maths curriculum. And it was a fairly loose arrangement. We just basically exchanged ideas. But um, last year, uh, we submitted a, a small uh, a funding for a small bid to um, the network to support um, doing this on a slightly more uh, organized basis. And we received funding for a year from uh, March 2010 through to this April, roughly 12 months. And the idea was that we would um, develop a series of very short case studies of how other colleagues in maths departments around the country had successfully implemented techniques to build a range of employability skills in the program. Um, and it culminated in a booklet, which uh, hopefully you've got a copy of, and if you haven't, we've got some spares <laughs> somewhere around, and there's a screenshot there of the front page. Um, as the project's actually officially finished now, but we did receive, we have got 17 case studies, um, and what we're going to do today, what I'm just going to start out by doing is talking a bit about the background uh, and the context for why we should be thinking about embedding employability in the curriculum and being aware of the fact that every university isn't the same. We are, we've got different objectives and different purposes, but the key thing here is there is a need for developing um, skills, student skills within the curriculum. And if I can begin by talking about a few fundamental questions. <laughs> um, the, it does really get to the heart of what we're thinking a degree is. Uh, I know many of you have talked to you briefly beforehand about uh, open days, and I think it starts from then, that when students come along to an open day, it's often quite surprising that they're not aware of the fact that universities are as different as they are in what's delivered with regard to a maths degree. They think they apply for BSc Maths, G100, and they may all be very similar. But the fact that there is no national curriculum at HE often comes as a surprise to visitors to open days um, because they'll be used to the idea that there is such a thing as a common curriculum. But if you look at the benchmark statement, which is the closest we've come to such a thing, in terms of mathematics, it only says that we have to teach calculus and algebra, but it says a whole lot about skills. And there is some pressure in order to build that in from a range of different sources I'll talk about shortly. But the very fundamental question about what is a degree and what's it for and what you're aiming to do comes to the heart of what we think about when we're developing a program. When you sit down and decide you're going to run a maths degree and, or re-validate re, re, uh, a maths degree, thinking about what you want the output to be from that process, you have to bear in mind what set of skills the, the graduates are going to have. And obviously a lot of the, those skills will be mathematical skills, but our view, and as, as we say at uh, Hallam, that um, if you think about the spectrum, at one end of the spectrum you'll have degrees which are essentially training um, research mathematicians. That is the, uh, the object of the exercise. Um, at the other end, we regard ourselves as being pretty much at the opposite end of the spectrum where we are uh, training students to use mathematics in a practical situation. So it's all about applications and practical uses. So in that case, um, it's very important for us that students can't just do the mathematics, but they can also apply the mathematics and understand how to put their skills into practice. And part of that will be the skills needed in order to communicate, for example, the results of their analysis to an, in an appropriate way to the target audience. So there's all sorts of skills to do with how you uh, communicate mathematics, how you work together as a group, which are also, in our view, very important. So this idea of what is a degree varies tremendously from one place to another. One other thing, I don't know if you've come across um, a document called If Only I'd Known. Has any, anybody heard of that at all? Not, it doesn't obviously ring any bells. Um, this is a publication which was produced by the Association of Graduate Recruiters, and it's a little bit long in the tooth now. It's 2002, I think, the publication date. But the object of it is looking from the perspective of a student who's just about to finish their degree. And it's entitled, if only I'd known, because of all the opportunities that student had missed, or perceived to have missed. And so it's intended to be, the target audience is people applying. 
so that you can try and raise their awareness at the time they're applying of all the possibilities that a degree offers. Now, this isn't just subject specific, of course, this is general. But the fact is, it's just as important for mathematics students to be aware of all those other things as, as any other subject. In fact, in some cases, you might argue more so. I mean, there is the caricature of the mathematics student who, very shy, sits in a corner and works in a uh, pencil and paper and doesn't talk to anyone. Um, but, you know, I think that is a caricature, but the fact is there is a perception that that is the, a typical mathematics student. So there is a certain degree of education involved there in terms of the general public. So I've already touched on some of those other bullet points up there. The thing is, how does maths at X differ from maths at Y? And I think it's really important that at open days, we make it as clear as we can to the audience exactly what it is we're offering where, you know, when we encourage them to come to us. And th that the same should go for anyone. We don't want somebody to come along and realize after the first few weeks, actually, this isn't what I expected at all. And you still do get that a little bit. But the fact is, you do your best to try and make it clear what it is you're offering. And I suspect with the um, increased fees coming through the next uh, uh, intake, that it'll become even more important to make it absolutely clear just what they're getting for their money. Even though, I have to say, I don't want to make any political points here, but even though we've not actually got any more money to do it with. So um, the, as their perspective will be, what are we going to get for this money? And we've got to be clear about that. There's a, a, little, a slide coming up shortly that talks about some of those issues again. So what skills should a graduate have and what should they expect in terms of all these items? So we are going to have to be very explicit about what we're delivering. Um, well, I'll mention it now, although it does come up. There's a key information set I'm sure you've heard about where we've got to publish details of exactly what students are going to get for their money in terms of contact hours, etc. I don't know if you saw, um, it just came up the other day on Friday, I think. There was a, David Willits was writing, I think I read it on the BBC website, but he, he said that this country needs to do better because our students only get an average of 30 hours contact time. <laughs> compared to Germany, which apparently has 42 hours contact time a week. And I thought, I don't know what planet he's on, but I don't know anywhere that delivers that kind of level of contact. Possibly some courses in medicine might somewhere, but you know, it's, uh, he's obviously thinking of something else. The point is, though, that uh, contact hours will be an important measure of what students are getting for their money. Even though we would argue, I would argue, I'm sure you would as well, that we deliver a lot more than just what you would see in terms of the contact hours. You know, students actually get an awful lot more from us than that. So it, it will be it, it, there's a lot of pressure on us to try and sell ourselves in terms of you know, what, what we're offering. So all of these features here are going to be important. But also, I've said here, there's a lot, uh, does it happen elsewhere, where people talk about student as partners. So the idea of a partnership between teaching, and, and, and teaching staff and students as being a partnership, what do we re really mean by that? Is it just rhetoric? Are we going to really um, sell ourselves and, and deliver on, on that type of uh, uh, idea? And the last point, the community of learning, I'm sure nobody would argue with the fact that uh, a successful environment for learning is one where all participants are working together with the same goal and the idea of a community is something obviously we would all like to encourage. But it is very much a matter of what we uh, tell students we're, we're doing. Um, I should say at this point that one of my roles at Sheffield Hallam is around employability. I perhaps ought to have made that clear at the start. I'm a 60% teach maths and 40% develop employability across the institution. So it isn't just within maths. So what, one of the, the stories we, we're trying to sell to all participants in the process across the university is the importance of making it as clear as we can to students exactly what it is they're getting from us. If, it's aspirational because this won't happen perfectly everywhere, but the idea is that if you uh, explain what you're doing clearly enough, then you expect students to at least understand why they're learning what they're learning. I think there's a lot of places where um, you will give out an assignment, say, and you don't really put it into context. You say, here's an assignment, here's a job to do, uh, go away and do it and hand it in on this date and I'll mark it and give you some marks. Whereas in fact, I think uh, it could be much more effective if we say to students, here's an assignment, this is what you will learn from this assignment, this is how it fits into the program, this is which part of the overall skill set you're getting from this assignment. And, and, I, and yes, I'll give you some some feedback. But the point is, it's explaining to them what it is you're doing and why you're doing it. So do we actually explain that the, the outcome of the degree should be X, Y, Z? You know, the, the set of skills we've decided the program should deliver. To what extent are we making the students aware of that? And how that every time we develop some skills, that they can see themselves working towards that ultimate goal. 
So the, the idea of a community of learning, coming back to that, is all about a real partnership and explaining to people what it is we're doing. It's, a, it's a quite a simple idea, really. It doesn't involve um, much change, to be quite honest. What a lot of people say to me from other disciplines, particularly those where PSRB, the, you know, um, uh, professional bodies are involved, the engineers are particularly bad at this, actually, um, because they're very protective of the subject content. They'll say, if, I don't, if we don't get all this into the degree, we won't get accreditation from the professional bodies. And that is at, uh, paramount. That's at, you know, um, they, they will not sell the degrees without that. So therefore, they're very worried about that. But I think we can do quite a lot, actually, to develop skills within the curriculum without losing all of that if we think a bit about learning, teaching, and assessment practice. So there's a whole load of things we can do all by way of background and discussing the, the, what's important here. Um, I've got a, a few slides here discussing what are the drivers. One of them is, comes from government, and these quotations are admittedly from uh, a, a, a period or documents released before the current coalition government came into power, but I think they still hold true now. The key thing here about how all universities have to demonstrate their commitment to employability, the idea of being upfront about what exactly they're delivering to students. Are these familiar? Have you seen these quotations at all? Possibly. <laughs> the first one um, led, well, it f follows on from, um, the, well, the idea was that universities would have to publish these things. The, last August, at the end of August last year, all, all universities had to write employability statements that were published on Unistats. So they were public, uh, publicly accessible statements on exactly what each university would deliver. And these have are essentially promises on what students will get. And so they are commitments, and they, they have certainly in our university led to some quite uh, serious commitments behind work-based learning. So we say that all students get work-based learning across the whole university, which is quite a commitment in some areas. We also say that all, all courses are designed in consultation with employers. Now, I'm pretty sure that isn't true. <laughs> But it's obviously the, the commitment there to do that now. So all new courses, you're going to have to explicitly show how employers have been involved in the design. We've got stopped short of saying and delivery. Some places say delivery as well, so that you get employers coming in to do part of the, uh, some of the lectures. But anyway, um, so there was something that came out of uh, the, these reports in terms of uh, a clear statement from universities about what they deliver. Um, students have also... Uh, made it clear that they expect this as well. Uh, in 2008, the National Student Forum was set up. Um, it's only run for three years. It's just closed. It's, last year, it's no longer in existence. But it was there, there long enough to release two annual reports. And in those reports, obviously, I've selected some of the comments here because they address the, the issues that we're talking about today. Students clearly expect to find, um, as, you, as you can see there, clearly, clearly defined employability strategy a well-resourced career service, etc. So the drivers coming from student bodies as well. You might not be surprised to learn that employers say this as well. Of course they want students with these skills. Why wouldn't they? You know? um, it was interesting that some, uh, early last year there was a report released with a percentage figure for how many students use their degree in their occupation. Now, obviously there are some like medicine and dentistry and all those um, vocational courses where it's a very high percentage. But on average, the percentage is only 40%. So obviously, allowing for the high percentage vocational courses, the others are lower than that. So very relatively few students actually ever go into a career using their degree. It's usually just taken as a generic training. Um, but so employers, what they're looking for are the skills to actually work uh, successfully within their organization. <coughs> Um, there's a few other quotes, a bit more recently, these are in, in The Guardian and on the BBC website. Um, the first one um, saying, almost half of all recent graduates believe their university education did not adequately equip them for the world of work. So this, it's all to do with student perception here. The second one's uh, an argument in favour of work, uh, work placement uh, uh, embedded in the programme. There are relatively few maths degrees which do this, and some of them that do don't have very many students actually taking part in it. Part of the reason for that, of course, is the difficulty of getting the placements. Um, on our program at Sheffield Hallam, th this current year we have about uh, 80 students on the second year, 
Um, and we have 20, well, about a quarter of our students do placement. I'll cut, cut it to the, cut to the chase. About 25%. So currently we've got 20 students working in a year-long work placement. So that, that has remained pretty constant. We'd like to do more, particularly since our university has promised that all students will get this. But um, we, we currently are looking at 25%. And of course, the third statement there is about um, the pressure that's going to be on us to deliver within the, in the area of high fees. Um, recently, you may be aware that the More Maths Greds project finished. It was 2007 to 10. And as part of that, um, a group of students were surveyed on their perceptions of what they were getting off their degree. So the 223 first-year students uh, from a variety of institutions, some Russell Group, some New University, a range of different institutions. So it wasn't selective. And the key thing here is we've got a range of different skills which they were um, asked about. And for the first um, four of those, the first four sets of skills, the expectation matched what they got, but more or less. So they were expecting they'd get them and they felt they did. But for the second, uh, the last group here, written, oral, communication, and presentation, so this is all kind of communication skills, they thought they were important because they're up in the 80s and 90%, but they, weren't, they didn't really expect that their course would deliver them. So you, I think there's quite a, an interesting uh, difference there between the first set and the second set of skills. The first ones are things they would have expected from the course and they expected to get, the, the second they didn't. <coughs> I'll come back to th those issues a little later on. So what has this led on to within universities? There's been a number of um, things. I've already mentioned the first item there, the employability statements. Uh, Hefke required all uh, students, to, uh, all universities to do this. And they are now, now in place. In fact, the HEA currently are engaged in a, a mapping exercise to try and pull out from all those statements what the common features are and to try to check to see whether it's happening. That's quite a tough thing to do, actually. Uh, I mentioned work placements because everything, all the evidence suggests that it's a really powerful uh, way of developing student employability. I mean, there was that quote earlier on pointing out a, th uh, a third of employers expect um, or to employ students who have already worked for them. So uh, there's plenty of other evidence as well. The, I don't know if you come across ASET, uh, Association of Sandwich Education Trainers. Um, they've re re released a report which uh, actually is... Um, uh, you could argue with the statistics of this, I guess, for obvious reasons, but they reckon that it delivers a higher, one, one grade higher. The expertise students pick up on placement delivers a higher grade in degree, one, one uh, degree grade higher. Of course, the trouble with that is that you're not measuring like we like, it, because you, the students who get placement tend to be the better students. So it is, it is a bit fraught with error, that statistic, but um, nevertheless, it is a fact. Um, many universities do offer employability awards. Does, does Greenwich have one? Do you know? Not sure. <laughs> um, when last, last Monday, um, we had a, a meeting at Hallam of a group called Employability Developers. It's a, um, there's a nationwide group where um, most of them are career professionals. But I, at that, I was doing this same talk at that meeting, and I said at this point, I think there's about 30 of the universities around the country which offer employability awards. And I got a bit shouted down because they said, no, 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 it's more like 90. Now, I mean, I don't know the facts of this because I've not looked into it, but it's clearly the case that many universities do um, accredit uh, uh, the employability skills as a separate thing, and in, in, they build it into what they call an award, and they, it's a certificate that students get alongside the degree certificate. There is something like that here, is there? Yeah. Um, I feel... Uh, yeah, okay. I feel somewhat ashamed that Hallam hasn't got one. We did try... Our um, executive group were very really reluctant to commit to it, and we tried and tried, because we did have a, an employability settle uh, in Hallam, and we felt a bit embarrassed that we didn't have an employability award, but we, we still haven't managed to do that. Um, but nevertheless, many universities have, and it's a way of identifying and highlighting what students are getting from their program outside the uh, degree-specific material. There are plenty of other key performance indicators that I'm sure you're aware of. The destination of Leavers from Higher Education survey, the one that reports on uh, graduate level employment after six months, uh, is now quite an important um, measure. Uh, certainly, we're being given targets to, to increase our showing in the table. Uh, I'm sure other people are. It's quite a difficult thing to do because of the, it's multifactorial. You know, that whether 
students are in graduate level employment after six months depends on to some degree on how they report so it's a talk to do with how students actually report their own activity at that time it's also a measure of the job market so it might just be very difficult for students to get jobs at that particular time um, it's also sector specific so it depends what type of career students are trying to go into and mathematics students go into a whole range of different sectors so there's a number of problems there if we're actually targeting ourselves and increasing our showing in that table. So, but nevertheless it's there and we need to address it. Uh, the National Student Survey is clearly important in all sorts of ways, but in terms of what we're talking about here, there are three questions in the personal skills section. The last three questions, 19, 20 and 21, so I'll say a few more words about that shortly. And obviously that is a, is a one, one handle, one measure on how students perceive the general skills they're getting from their program. Um, and all the other league tables that these feed into, such as the one that's been released today, the uh, Guardian 2012 tables have come out today, um, and there's the Sunday Times table, and a few other ones as well. All of the league table measures of performance, are people, people are focusing very clearly on those at the moment, with the higher fees coming through, and the key information sets, the next item here, where in which, as we mentioned a bit earlier on, uh, courses, it, down, it goes down to course level, we'll have to report on what students are getting in a number of different key areas. The last one there, I don't know whether you've done anything in this university to prepare for the higher education achievement record or report, I'm not sure what the second, the last R refers to, but the here was meant to be, as an output from the Verges report in 2007, um, in which there's a general perception that a degree certificate is not giving us enough information and a transcript where, with more detail is required. This is largely, supposedly, for the benefit of employers, so they've got a way of seeing what the capabilities are of individual students beyond the degree grade. So the Higher Education Achievement Record has been piloted, I think, in about 11, 12 universities, and it's supposed to be implemented across the whole um, country next September, but I think it's all seemed to have gone rather quiet. And I don't know whether this is because Hefke are a bit worried that they're imposing uh, a greater burden on universities to deliver this over that time scale. Um, it possibly it's going to be put back a bit. But it, as, as far as I know, talking to various people who should know about this, it's still on the books. It's still there and it will be implemented. It's just perhaps it's slowed down a little bit. But there is a section in the here, called section 6.1 of the here, in fact, which requires students to... Um, uh, report on their other skills and it has to be accredited it can't just be what students have said they've done it has to be some form of evidence that they've achieved certain level of skill in those areas but it does give students the opportunity to report on how they've built up a whole set of other skills in the program and it will likely impinge upon what students do by way of personal development planning so it does have a bearing on on what we're talking about today but the detail of it remains to be seen um, I mentioned the subject benchmark I've just highlighted here from our 2007 benchmark statement. Um, the things, or some of the things relating to general skills. So you can see clearly highlighted there from the benchmark statement, students will possess general study skills, they can work independently, skills in time management and organisation, communication skills, team working, uh, communication, being able to write coherently. All of those things are, are mentioned explicitly in the statement. Um, and it's up to us to, to build that in, if, if we want to meet, the, the, the meet, meet what the statement is saying. I, I shall just skip past this, because you can come up with any set of lists of these things, but just so we're clear about the sort of things we're talking about, possibly that ought to have come earlier on. But there is a list of so-called graduate skills, and you can mix and match these quite a lot, um, but you know what sort of things we're talking about. The student survey I mentioned earlier on, these, these are the three questions which have a bearing on personal skills. So it's about whether students can present themselves with confidence, whether the communication skills have improved, and whether they're confident in tackling unfamiliar problems. In retrospect, we might have asked different things, but these, this is what we've got. So it is uh, a measure of what students think about what they're getting. So it's only the student perception of that. It's, no, it's not an objective measure. And the data that um, I've used, and I'll show you shortly, come from uh, the raw data presented at Unistats. So you can download the spreadsheet, uh, freely available, quite a big, well, a relatively big one. It's about 40 or 50 megabytes, but um, it's got everything in there. And in there, 
the way it's presented is levels two, three, and, uh, one, two, and three. Level one being just the top level subjects. Level two gives you a bit more fine resolution in terms of subject con titles. And level three is even more. So the, we're looking here at level two. There are 42 subjects which are reported in the NSS at level two. There's something like 110 at level three if you want that level of detail. Um, in actual fact, it doesn't make a lot of difference for, for our discipline. Curiously, in level two, and I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm getting this the right way around, but in one it's maths and stats, and the other one it's mathematical sciences. So I don't really know why there's a difference. But the point is it's pretty clear which one to look at in either. So what I've got uh, in, in, in the link below here is the data for these three years. And what I've done, um, I'm sure this is not unique, other people have done this. In fact, uh, for, uh, Pete, you were saying that uh, Plymouth had looked at this as well, haven't, you? haven't they? But what I've done is to average the data for all the institutions reporting for each of those three years and look to see where mathematical sciences or maths and stats comes um, in the table. Um, nearly use the mouse there. So assuming the, the link works, that's good. Um, so this, this web page is basically what I did. I took the spreadsheet, took, put the data into a database, MySQL database, and I've got a program running here which interrogates the database. And so these, you can see each of the 22 questions along the top, and it comes up by default with question 22, which is this one, the overall I am happy question. And as you can see, mathematical sciences is doing pretty well out there. In this year, tw 2010, there were 63 institutions reporting in the NSS. And overall, you can see 89% were happy it, with math mathematical sciences. And this is out of, um, scroll, hang on, i do it this way. If I scroll down, 42, this is the 42 subject areas, okay? So I'll scroll back up again. Say what, sorry? The math students do what they're told, <laughs> and the art students are much more bullshit. Okay, you could argue, yeah. I mean, the, the, with, with any table like this, there will be all sorts of ways you could debate the meaning of it all, uh, as you'll see shortly. But I just want to point out some, some interesting fe features. One is the consistency of this. So if I look at 2009, third, and 2008, fourth, so the consistently up in the top few subject disciplines, and that's for question 22. If I come to question, these, these are the three that we were talking about, question 19. The course has helped me present myself with confidence. Um, unfortunately, it last. <laughs> um, and question 20, well, I'll go back to the other year. 2009, same story. And 2010, Same story again. So there's some consistency about this. Let's look at the next question. Um, question 20. This is my communication skills have improved. Unfortunately, bottom again. Uh, well, I'll, I'll save you the trouble. It's the same for all years. Okay, bottom. And that's this one here. Okay. <laughs> It's a slightly better story for 21. Um, I feel confident in tackling unfamiliar problems. So for 2008, 30th out of 42. And 2009 and 10, it's a, it's a very consistent picture. 28th, 2010, 28th. So, um, and if you look at the figures, they're very close together actually. I mean, you know, they're down in the percentages, all these 77. So really, there's not an awful lot to choose between them, to be quite honest. But the key thing is really the, the, the consistency with which students perceive they're not getting those skills. Now, the fact that they're still happy, you could take those two results together and argue that actually maybe they're not too worried about this. You know, they're, they're not getting the skills, but they're not worried about it. Um, and, and taken together with the earlier table <laughs> from the More Maths Grads project, there, there seems to be a fairly consistent thing. They can see this isn't happening, but they actually don't seem to be too concerned. And uh, of course, these students, remember the final, these are final year students, and they should be thinking about getting jobs when they're doing, filling in the survey. Um, you would think that they ought to think that these skills should be important. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I'm not, I haven't got really time. If anyone's interested in looking later on, you can look at these other questions because it's quite, it gives quite an interesting perspective of the subject as a whole. And actually, there are many here where we do pretty well as a discipline across the, across the country. There's some where we're not so good and some where we're actually consistently doing really well. But um, I'll, I'll not dwell on that right now. And so I've summarised that in the following table here. So you can see here there's a consistent picture across the years that uh, I've taken from the survey uh, of the su subject disciplines as a whole per apparently performing badly. But as I say, you have to take uh, those into context. So it's just a, a, another added thing to, to think about when bearing in mind the need to build in skills into the curriculum. So with all that in my way of context, our program of study, this, um, this project, as you can see up there, ran for a year, up, uh, 2010 through to this Easter. And the three principal aims, as you can read there, they're essentially what I described earlier on. What we wanted to do was to capture what worked well and across the country for people who were reporting, to try and think about what it was that worked well, possibly why it worked, you know, because obviously the intention or the hope is that you can make some suggestions for what might work elsewhere. The, the mode of operation here was very much about keeping them short, so very short two-page case studies in, focused on the skills. So the idea being if you wanted to find out how uh, group working could be encouraged in a mathematical program, you could see which of these case studies dealt with group working, for example. So they were categorized by skill as well as, well as um, by title. Um, what this slide is um, trying to put across is something that's worked for us at Hallam. Um, I mentioned earlier on my role is 40% in employability. Um, what we're trying to do is to put our development of employability on a sound footing across the university and it follows on from our employability statement. We're actually promising all these things. So therefore, we ought to be making sure that each of the courses at the university is addressing them. So by categorizing them in this way, it makes them easier to measure. Uh, you could come up with other categories, but it seems to work quite conveniently that we can separate these things out into work-based learning, work-related learning. Uh, the second one, I've been careful to, to put PDP somewhere out, out of immediate. So I didn't want to just call it personal development planning because you may well have found this if you try to do it yourself. If you say to a group of students, right, we're going to do personal development planning, you can see them switching off um, straight away. It won't be immediately interesting. It's not, you're not going to fire people up with that. Mary, you might have something to say about this as well. But um, <laughs> what seems to work, though, uh, if you, have, you get students early on at the beginning of the course, they're usually pretty enthusiastic at that time because they're, they, they're, they're receptive. They've, they've applied to the course, they've turned up, they're keen to learn, they want to find out what you're going to do for them. And at that stage, what you want to do is to tap into that by talking a bit about how can they achieve their potential? You know, what is the, the right approach to helping them develop as far as they can to maximize their achievement? You can find all sorts of ways of expressing it, but the key thing really is all about getting them to think about what steps they need to take in order to do that. And the idea of reflection and action planning is essentially that. It's something that you want people to, th to, to do. Um, whether you do it in a formalized way where you require something to be carried out and evidence and all the rest of it, or whether you choose to do it in a less formal way, the key thing really is whether students can see you the purpose of it and what it is you want them to do. So under, underpinning all of this is the need to think about what they're doing and to identify where things are going wrong and to come up with a plan for dealing with those deficiencies. So the idea of reflection action planning is the, the important, that's the process, that's what you want people to engage with. PDP might be a thing so that they do to, to, to engage with that process. Um, one problem we have when we talk about PDP is it means different things to different people. Uh, certainly, the, because it's an acronym, there's some argument about what the second P is. Is personal development planning, or is it a personal development portfolio? Or some people say PPDP, or there's all sorts of other ways of saying PDP, but actually it's not quite the same thing. If you talk to people in the creative arts, for example, it's actually their work, work portfolio. It's a thing they actually carry around with them. An example of their work, uh, film students have showreels as their evidence of work. But the, the key thing here is it's not the reflection thing. It's actually wor a work portfolio. 
That's, it should include some reflection. Most of these portfolios ought to have some commentary that go with the, the work. So the portfolio side is still important. And actually, it was part of what we were re required to do by 2005 with regard to the progress files. And the idea was that you would have uh, the, the reflection thing, whatever that was going to be, but also a portfolio of work. So this PDP, because it's kind of uh, a bit, bit mutable, it can be a range of different things according to who you're dealing with, it's a bit dangerous just to use it on its own. You need to really say what it is you want students to do. So I've, it's an awful long way round for me to say reflection action planning, but that's, the, that's how we've categorised that side of it. Career management skills is all about, of course, the practical skills in job hunting, uh, the, the CV production, the uh, job applications, the job seeking, uh, the interview preparation, knowing how to deal with difficult questions, interview, uh, being able to articulate skills, those practical skills that students need in order to get, actually go and get a job, which are categorised differently because actually they are quite a different thing. They are separate from what we're dealing with in the curriculum. Whether they are embedded within the curriculum and assessed is something that might cause a bit of contention. You know, it could be dealt with differently or it might be built into the curriculum. We've actually promised that it will be built into the curriculum. So again, it's a, it's a university promise that students will get that. Now, item four looks like everything else, which in fact it is. It's all the other skills we want to build in, except the ones mentioned above. So that would be all the elements in that list that we presented earlier on. So if you classify um, things according to these four elements, what you get from the 17 case studies are, is something like this. Now, you could argue, and I'm sure some of the case study authors will argue with me about the, the categorization, whether they're happy with what I've written there. Um, and you could, you could jiggle it around. But essentially, you'll notice that one and three are fairly sparse. So relatively few of these case studies are addressing um, the uh, items one and three, which were work-based learning and career management skills. So those side of it isn't dealt with as clearly as the others. Lots of, lots of the case studies address the other skills category four, not so many one and three, but they are there. There are some examples there. Um, so this is actually the last slide you may be pleased to hear. <laughs> there are a number of questions that we could ask at this point, and these just happen to be four. I've plagiarized from colleagues who wrote this in connections, as you can see in the reference at the top. Um, what is it that we think we ought to be considering here? And these might be a focus for discussion later on. The question is, if you're going to have skills built into the program, what mechanism should you use to do it? I would say, in answer to this question, should be a skills module, I'd say no, firmly. It's a debate you could have. There's clearly a lot of people that build in skills through an add-on module, which d deals with that. Now, if you do that, the danger is, of course, students don't see its relevance to the subject, and they'll see it as something they can safely ignore. It's not something they're picking up along the way. It actually subverts the whole idea of building in employability into the curriculum. So I would argue the answer is clearly a no, that um, it's, it's a subject that can be debated. Um, skills, how can skills such as writing, presenting, and working with others be developed through mathematical activity? I think this goes um, to the heart of really what we're trying to achieve here. Um, clearly what we're engaging students with are mathematical activities. That's what we do in the program. Those activities need to be um, wide-ranging, I think, if we expect students to build a wide-ranging set of skills. If you, are, if you um, teach your mathematics by sitting people down in the room and giving them a sheet of problems to solve, and they sit there and do that, they'll probably get very proficient at using the techniques necessary to solve those problems. But will they learn anything else? They're very unlikely to learn teamworking skills or uh, communication skills uh, if you don't ask them to do this. So um, if you want these things to be learned, it stands to reason that what you need is to build into the program a set of activities and possibly assessment tasks which require students to do this. Um, so to make that explicit, I think, is really important. So having some way in which you can badge the employability side of what we're doing in some overt way is really important. So one of the things that we try to do is to build in a pathway where you can have a diagram which says at each level of the course, or possibly in each module, what skills students are learning over and above the mathematical skills. And so they can see, and everybody else can see, how that all hangs together. So it's a coherent whole. Some universities, in fact, one of the case studies here, which we don't have a representative of, but I can mention it, is the uh, University of West of England project, 
which deals with something they call the Graduate Development Programme. And this is a university-wide scheme which does exactly this. The whole idea is to make it clear as possible where, within the programme, students are getting each of these skills. And it doesn't require a great deal of, in fact, it requires hardly any extra effort. Once the things are happening, once those activities are there taking place, all you're doing is highlighting the fact. That's it. Um, at, at Hallam, I'll sort of digress a little bit here, and there is a reason for this. One of my other roles at Hallam is course validation. I'm a validation panel chair. So w when a new course comes through for approval, what you have to do is to sit down with a group of people, look at what they're proposing, and um, argue through what is the student experience here, are they actually addressing all the issues they should be looking at, and yes, you have an external person who can come and look at the quality of the course. But the key thing really is, it's a mechanism for ensuring that the courses adhere to the university principles. And one of those principles will be, are they delivering against the four sets of employability criteria that we're looking at? So it's quite interesting to see how different people have managed this. And one of the things we almost always find is that when we ask the question, are you delivering X, Y, Z? Oh yes, we do it there or we do it here. They're able to articulate when needed in the panel meeting where the skills are being built, but it's not in the documentation. And do they tell the students, well, no, they don't see the need to make that plain. Whereas it seems a pretty obvious thing that if you've got a, a simple way of identifying where within the course these skills are being developed, why not make that plain? Why not have a simple diagram that shows it and show it to all participants? So this idea, I've, I have digressed a bit, and I apologise for that, but this, this idea that you, you've got to be as transparent as possible about this seems obvious to me. The last question, oh no, not the, last, the third one, could a learning log have a role? This is all about uh, uh, recording activities in some way throughout the programme. And the idea is part of the reflective thing, uh, but you're doing so in a way that gets it recorded and can be reflected on at a later date. So this idea of having a learning log, um, to what extent could that actually help us and help students do, do what we're asking? The last point is quite contentious as well. It's about assessment of skills. You know, should they be assessed, and if so, how? And I think you get a, a range of different answers to that according to who you ask. Um, our view is that without assessment, student engagement suffers. You know, student, unless they're going to be getting credit for it, they'll tend to think, A, it's not that important, and B, they can concentrate on something else. So it probably won't happen. So it is important to assess, but then, of course, you're giving over from within your program some of the assessment marks from the core content to skills. So that will cause some, uh, some people a bit of a few, loss of sleep, possibly. So that's the, essentially where we're at. That's the, that, that, that's the end of the presentation. Um,